So with that, we're going to ask a lot of these questions of a good friend of mine, and uh, he's from ESPN. Mr. King, why don't you come up? We'll have a little fireside chat. ESPN, if you would welcome them. So Rob King. So Rob, you're the senior vice president of digital and print and pretty much everything at ESPN, it seems like. Um, ESPN.com, mobile, you do stuff for the fantasy sports. You're yes. like a god over there. You're almost bigger than, matter of fact, I heard that the Walt Disney Company now reports to ESPN that you guys throw off so much margin and revenue. Is that true? Time to go. <laughs> um, so tell us about yourself a little bit and what are the challenges that you see currently facing ESPN? Well, first I got a lot of pressure because that brother in the back corner was on the video talking about how he wanted to hear me speak, so I got to deliver. That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is, yeah, I'm happy to be here. And when I say that, I mean uh, my wife and I have three kids, nine and under, and we went to Washington, D.C. on Saturday, and my wife was going to come with me, except something went wrong at my parents' house where they're staying, and so my wife is there, upset that she's not here, and my kids are restless and bored. So when I say I'm happy to be here, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> um, what I do at ESPN is oversee a, a broader range of, of uh, content. So video and audio and text across all of our digital and print properties. Um, it's a lot of storytelling. Uh, and what makes ESPN unique is that I don't do it in the digital and print vacuum. We spend a lot of time in the same room with television and radio. We look at the year around in terms of sports calendar holidays. Uh, in our world, generally things are on a calendar, so we have a way of planning across all of our screens as to how we're going to attack any kind of event. And then we have the happy circumstance of waking up on Saturday morning and finding out that Kobe Bryant is gone for the season and Tiger Woods might be disqualified from the Masters, and that's not on any calendar. And because we're arrayed the way we are, we're instantly in con connection with each other saying, here's how we'll produce this, here's how we'll do that, you know, and in that little, little burst of activity, what it man the way it manifests itself is a Saturday morning on ESPN on SportsCenter that is just really rich. Uh, and then in short order, by Saturday morning, we start looking at the metrics. There's probably in, in total about 1.2 million views of Kobe Bryant video and about 900,000 views of Tiger Woods disqualification video, which really is, you know, that's, that's a happy surprise, but it's not really a surprise. It's just based on how we sit together. So ESPN is, uh, I would, I would claim is very, very well known to be really a pioneer in the space across all these channels. Yep. How do you really plan um, from a content standpoint differently for all these different screens that we're talking about? Well, before I get too far, I just want to make sure how many people here are not sports fans? Raise your hands high. Don't be fearful. Because if I make any kind of reference that's sports related, I want to make sure that I don't leave you behind. OK, <laughs> so Tiger Woods is a golfer, and he's very good. <laughs> Um, so uh, the way we do it, look, this, this goes way back, right? This is not new for us. And I think 2001, our president at the time, George Bodenheimer, announced to the world, we're a multimedia company. Right? We're not just a television company that happens to be in a bunch of other places. We're a multimedia company. And we also, for quite some time, have been talking very specifically about serving fans. Serving sports fans is our true north. So whatever sports fans are doing or whatever they expect, we move ourselves to do. Uh, John Skipper, who's our current president, did not come through the traditional television channels to become the leader of our organization. He came from print and digital and gaming and a whole bunch of these other things that some people think is add-ons, but are really kind of central to our promises of how we serve fans. So ultimately, uh, we have been kind of believing this and living this for quite some time. Again, like I said, there's so much in the sports world that enables us to kind of predict how we need to array ourselves. But we also spend a lot of time looking at data. And while it's absolutely true, measurement may be broken in some cases, uh, data tells us a lot about how we can best serve fans. So we know, for example, the top 100 sports franchises by virtue of affinity, time spent, ratings, um, you know, a little quiz. There are 31 of the 32 NFL teams in the top 100. Can anybody name the one that is not in the top 100? Excellent. Jaguar, Jacksonville Jaguars is correct. Um, Number one NBA team. Lakers? Uh, it is the Lakers. 
It is the Lakers. Although, when we created the Heat Index a couple of years ago, when LeBron James made the decision, LeBron James is a very good basketball player. <laughs> um, when LeBron James made the decision, we created something called the Heat Index because we had the hunch and the traffic was telling us that the Miami Heat were going to be a big deal. And in that first year, it accounted for almost half of all of our NBA page views, uh, you know, just because of the storyline. But we spent a lot of time sharing that information back and forth. Um, you know, we know that a weekend where Kobe Bryant and Tiger Woods are headlines is an all hands on deck experience. So how important is, we talked about, I talked about YouTube just because of the largest, and no particular reason besides that, I guess, but how important is YouTube as a distribution channel? And then last year, I think it was a year ago, you did your deal with Xbox, uh, which is where I watch a lot of your content on Xbox. So how important are those distribution deals to you is question number one. And question number two, do you see television networks, others, your competitors, doing the same type of thing, or no? Well, I'm gonna answer your second question first. There seem to be a number of people trying to play in this space. Uh, I have an Xbox and you know, my, my son, who's now nine, loads stuff up and I'm just seeing channels that I didn't see before. So that's happening. You know, it's undeniable that YouTube represents this scale opportunity that's attractive. And so to that extent, uh, you know, YouTube is considerable. Um, we, certainly, we certainly think that the content we produce has a value. We've spent a lot of time creating it and it's unique. And so you know, to that extent, I think we have more of a balanced conversation. We try to have a balanced conversation with that YouTube relationship. Xbox is really a, a, a cool factor for us. I mean, I think last in March, we had uh, the average, the average uh, Xbox user of ESPN content spent about 230 minutes. Um, uh, 260, I think, was the high point in June, 2000, June 2012. And that was when we had Euro cha EuroLeague championships and NBA finals, and so people were coming to watch, watch ESPN there. But you know, March was a very big month for us, which Pretty amazing when you consider we don't have the tournament games. We have our sort of run up to the NCAA tournament, but we don't actually have the tournament games. We have the women's tournament. But uh, you know that number in March was substantial. So it's a it's a big part of you know the watch ESPN future. Right. Was the Xbox deal good for you, or would you would you do it again type of thing? Looking back. Again, my point of view is we're here to serve fans, and we know how fans are changing. We know how younger fans are behaving. It absolutely makes sense for us to try to be in this space. So in the presentation this morning, um, the first one at, I think it was 6 a.m., um, that was a joke from the West Coast, so I don't know, it was probably it was 5 a.m. my time or something. Anyways, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the morning presentation, uh, you had some great slides um, and talked about the big screen being dominant, uh, meaning television. How important is smartphone and tablets for your future. How, where do you see that currently today, and where do you see that going over time? All right, so I've, refer I've referenced my son already once. Okay, when I, I, He's nine. When I became a father, I became much smarter. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about, I wanna talk about audience expectation before I delve into that question. When my son was three, he taught me what audience expectation really means. My parents, where everybody are right now, my parents are taking care of my grandmother, who's 100 years old. When she turned 95, they took her into the house, and they had to do a renovation pro uh, project. So we couldn't come visit. Um, finally, when the project was over, we drove down to, to visit my parents. Same thing happens every time. My son runs in to find my dad. Uh, so he runs in to find my dad, and he sees this new door. And he says, what's that? And my dad says, well, I'll show you. Opens the door, pulls the aside a gate. I heard this joke. Yeah, no. Pulls aside a gate, they go into this little room. Closes the door, closes the gate, pushes a button, room shakes. Opens the gate, opens the door, he's on the second floor. My son's like, whoa. All right, three days, up, down, up, down, up, down. After three days, we drive back to Connecticut. All day drive. It's late. Bringing him in the house. Come on, big chief, let's go. Pick him up, carry him up the stairs. And he says, where's the elevator? Because audience expectation is, if you have an experience one time, that's yours. And if it doesn't work, we know this about apps. You get like 1.3 shots with an app, and if it doesn't work, they're out. This is all about meeting audience expectation, all right? So what we find is the question really isn't about like mobile, it's about mobility. Our audience expects to have an experience at any time, wherever they are. Fandom is just different now. And you think about your own behavior, it really is about mobility. No matter where you are, we're consuming so much information, we have so much expectation about what we have access to. No matter where you are, there's somewhere you're not. There's something you're not doing. So 
You're not on Twitter right now, or maybe you are. You're not reading email right now, or maybe you are. You're not consuming video, or maybe you are. You're always displaced at some point. So what we try to do is recognize that about our fans. Our fans want to know, like we're always in pre-game or in-game or post-game. So Trisha said it best. Our fans want to know what's going to happen. Our fans want to, they want to see what's happening. And so they might go to a big screen. But they also want to understand what, why this is happening or what's going to happen next, even as they're consuming on a big screen. And then afterwards, they really want to know why something happened. So the way we look at all of our screens is we've got to make it as easy as possible to meet that audience expectation. So for us, that may mean really looking at you know, a highlight and saying, you know, look, we can't be passive about this. This just happened. We need to deliver this now. We need to create a video alert. We've got 10.2 million people subscribed to SportsCenter alerts. We've got, in the last couple of months, we've sent more than 2 billion alerts to 2.1 million users. And part of that alert system is active publishing. So an incredible play happens. We want to send an alert to somebody to say, play this clip right now. Um, the way we also think about it is we have a game cast experience. It's really rich, tons of data, tons of information. My reporters are actually having a live chat with fans. So the live chat uh, audience has grown 30% year over year. So you know, the other day when, when Michael Collins got ready to do the chat for the Masters um, and Tiger Woods might have been disqualified, there were like 680 people in the chat room three hours before the chat started. And they expect that chat to go on while they're consuming live golf. The other thing we're thinking about, when you're, you're watching a game, you want to know when a great play happens. So with a product like Watch ESPN, where you're actually watching a game, we're actually building in a functionality where we can send you a video alert, a great play happens. So say you're a fan of the Yankees and something bad happens to the Red Sox. We can send you an alert in watch where you can click on that alert and the screen will go side by side and you can watch this clip while you're watching the game. It's the same thing as when SportsCenter breaks in in-game and shows you a great play. Um, and we're, we're, we're imagining all of these uses for all of our screens to be complementary to the big screen. Or if you can't get to the big screen, to give you as rich and as full an experience as possible. We talk a lot about second screen. We also talk about simultaneous screen. The point here is that the audience's expectation is, for us, in terms of the relationship with ESPN, to get smarter, to know what's going to happen, to see what happened, to share what happened. 1983, when Jim Valvano's uh, NC State team won the national championship, there was a great Final Four game the two days before. And Louisville played Houston. It was one of the great all-time college basketball games. And I was in a bar in Middletown, Connecticut, with seven of my friends screaming our brains out at the TV set. That's, that's what's happening now. It's just a different delivery device. It's just a different system. It might be Twitter, it might be instant messaging, what have you. There's still a video experience. There's still a communal experience. And these are the things that we just have to allow technology to help us do better. So how do you, uh, when you think about meeting these consumer expectations, um, how do you, as a, as, as a programmer, how do you program differently or do you across these different devices? How do you go about doing it? It's, it's one thing to talk about it, yeah. it's another thing to kind of do it. So how does ESPN approach that? Well, I mean, look, we, we kind of look at how people behave. Uh, one of the things we're finding out that we think is really interesting is that there's very different consumption between the online screen and the handset experience. So online and tablet, pretty similar. People will watch, they'll watch SportsCenter highlight of the night. It's a narrative, it's about two minutes, two and a half minutes. Or they'll watch the Grantland shorts that can go as long as 10 minutes. On a handset, people are consuming video irrespective of storyline. They want to see a play. They want to see a crazy, crazy play. So Citrus Bowl on New Year's Eve, there's this play in the, in the um, South Carolina-Michigan game where uh, a young man named Jadavian Clowney, his name is Jadavian Clowney. I'm going to say it again because you're going to know it in three years when he's in the NFL. Jadavian Clowney. A young man named Jadavian Clowney, who does not really adhere to the same laws of physics and gravity that we do, blasts through an offensive line, hits a running back so hard, his helmet flies off. He drops the ball. Jadavian Clowney picks up the ball, right? The way we had to think about that play was, we got to send that play out as a highlight clip as quickly as possible to handsets or however possible so people can see that and share because it, it happened in the moment. But at the same point, sports has got to cut a highlight about who won the Citrus Bowl. Again, in the last 11 weeks, 
there have only been four videos that have made the top 10 list of most consumed online video and most consumed mobile video. And those four videos are, uh, was Rex Ryan, the coach of the New York Jets, was his wife's tattoo of Tim Tebow real? That's one. Number two was about Manti Teo's invisible girlfriend. Manti Teo is a linebacker for Notre Dame, and he has a girlfriend he didn't exist. Um, <laughs> this is true. I'm that telling you, you've got to like be me. a sports fan. You'd hear these things, they're great stories. Can't make that up. Uh, number three was the winner of the NBA dunk contest, and number four was Kevin Ware, who was a University of Louisville basketball player a couple weeks ago, broke his leg in a gruesome, gruesome incident. And what's really interesting about that is we didn't show the, the broken leg. We, we, we showed it was more of a contextual thing. Um, it was not, it was, it was, but it was a moment, right? And everybody wanted to dive into that moment. Another example, like from, just from last night, you know, so last night this guy, Adam Scott, wins the Masters. Um, very popular uh, outcome for the, for the ladies, we've noticed. But, so Adam Scott wins the Masters. Um, and so I just took a look to see, you know, what our most consumed video was. And, the, and Adam Scott winning the Masters was the number six. The number one video was something we call Red Light, Green Light, where Scott Van Pelt and Andy North sit there and talk about what was going to happen, what was, what was likely going to happen, why it would happen. It was contextual. It wasn't necessarily a storyline. And it was easy to consume. It was very, very quick. So, you know, again, to get to, get to your point, we're, we're, uh, we're really watching how the audience is consumed. There's video starts, there's completions, there's shares, all that stuff. We have a product called Newsbeat that was developed for us by a group called Chartbeat. And at any moment, I can, I can know how many people are on the site, how many people are consuming what piece of content, um, how many people are sharing it, where people are coming from, um, and what's blowing up. And you know, uh, we, we share that uh, information broadly. So you may have noticed SportsCenter has, has changed dramatically over the last six months. SportsCenter has a very important relationship with its audience to let people know what's going on at all times and to elevate really interesting, cool stuff. So a few weeks ago, SportsCenter led with a video, led, the first thing you saw was a cheerleader do a flip holding a basketball and then come out of the flip and make a, a shot from half court. It's because it was totally cool and totally unexpected. And the kind of thing that was already in our mobile plan, we just knew, look guys, you know, this is, this is the thing. Um, during the uh, AFC playoffs, uh, Sports Center cut a highlight after the Denver Baltimore game that was very sequ sequential in, in manner. So here's what happened in the first quarter, here's what happened in the second quarter, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and in the digital space, what was really blowing up was the decision by the Denver Broncos quarterback, Peyton Manning, to sit on the ball, to not try to score before the end of the game. Um, and so we communicated with Sports Center. By the time they got around to the next highlight, that's what they, that's what they started the show with. All right, so our learning about what audience is talking about, you know, what's blowing up in our space. This is fueling all of our stuff. So setting expectations for advertisers. Advertisers have a lot of expectations as well. Um, when you think about content and distribution of content, and you think of about uh, doing that across multiple devices or screens, how are you getting one view of the customer, either from a content standpoint or from the advertiser standpoint? And then that one view, there was a question that was earlier in the first session that I thought was very good. Typically, advertisers or agencies um, historically have planned by channel, so it's very kind of siloed. So in this case, it'd be TV, mobile and tablet, maybe desktop, you know, et cetera. Whereas now, because there's this cross-device viewing, you want to kind of link those together and some sort of, um, you know, bridge them together and there's companies out here in the audience that do that for folks. How is ESPN bridging that together, getting one view of the customer so you can serve them this content mm -hmm. uh, either sequentially um, across devices? So the way we really think about this is informed by data. Um, what we try to do uh, is, is ask ourselves, what did we learn the last time? Where were people? What did they share? Uh, what can, we, what can we do next? In my group, in the content group, we say all the time, every content conversation is a product conversation. Okay. So we're not just creating content willy-nilly. We're actually really thinking about how it fits into the fan's life. Because we, we know, look, there is no mass audience anymore. It's a massive audience of individuals. We have this mantra internally, live personal social, live personal social. 
And that is something that television works with us on. Um, and that is something that we think about every time we develop an app. Right now, we got about, I want to say, 26 million registered users on ESPN.com. We have many more visitors. But those 26 million registered users are people who've actively visited in the last 12 months. Uh, about a 17% increase in those registrations in the month of March. Not an accident. The reason that happened was because we created a couple of app experiences designed to drive home the value proposition of registering with ESPN and giving us information about your fandom. We have a product called Score Center that has about 40 million downloads, uh, and its revamped version of Score Center will, will drive scores of your favorite teams first, will deliver content that is what you want first. You heard Adam talk about that. Um, Bracketbound was a, an app we created around the college basketball NCAA tournament and our tournament challenge game, the bracket game. Same deal. If you register with us and you give us information, we're going to drive your bracket news. We're going to drive highlight clips. We're going to drive um, you know, com uh, co uh, contextual clips. So we've got coaches telling you why something's going to happen, or why it isn't going to happen. Um, and then we created something called the Sports Center Feed which enables you to take the massive quantity of information. We publish like you know, 800 to 1,000 new pieces of content every day on ESPN.com and across digital video and across sports center video. It allows you to turn it into a Twitter-like or, or Facebook-like feed so that you can manage the flow of the tonnage. And all that is designed really for us to be able to then go back when we sit in our broader planning meetings and say, all right, tonight, X game is happening. All right. What's the pregame strategy? What's the in-game strategy? What's the post-game strategy? Uh, and the in-game strategy can be everything from the way we have a group we call the Raps group. So they break in for commercial break and they tell you, hey, you know, coming up at halftime, blah blah blah, and they do our halftime shows. The Raps group has a role. The alerts team has a role. The news desk has a role in terms of telling us what reporters are seeing and hearing from the field. Uh, you know, all shows have their specific roles. Uh, and we understand that like, we have to be motivated. We have this group, Stats and Analysis. Stats and Analysis is a group of about 220 people. They manage the bottom line. They're creating real-time stats from games. Um, they're watching every game. And we're all talking to each other so that we are coordinated across all of our areas. This is just the content approach. But we understand that we're delivering a bunch of products in real time, really good video content on television. Uh, ex personalized experiences in the digital space, a bottom line that is sort of our spine that's carrying like a real-time news and information, radio, which is driving this conversation when you're in transit, designed to sort of keep it all rolling together. Um, Sports Center's role is to be that most familiar news and information brand that permeates all of these. And as Vice President Craig Bankston, who, who, uh, he's the Vice President of uh, Sports Center, as he and I and a number of other people continue to dig in and think about where SportsCenter is, we're really excited about you know, what we're learning and how we're using all these platforms. They're not, they're not driving a separate conversation. They're driving a conversation that, if you really think about how fans use us, forces us to be really smart about how and where we, do, we send our firepower. So interestingly, Dave Hollerman from eMarketer, he's a, he's a researcher and uh, produces white papers and what have you. Um, claim that online video will be so disruptive that TV will have to integrate it, integrate with it. Do you agree with this? Um, what do you think the future of television is? Well, I can only tell you what happens in our shop. Um, we kind of think that's true already. Um, I'll give you an example. We have this fantastic Spanish language entity, ESPN Deportes. Um, and they turn out a ton of work. Uh, and we created a, a soccer brand, ESPN FC. And we sat down with Deportes and said, here's what we'd love to do with FC. And Deportes said, here's what we're creating, and uh, let's sort of make this happen together. And you know, before we came in here, I was looking at uh, the numbers of videos consumed last month on ESPN FC. It's up 800% year over year, up 50% over last month, just because the way, we, the way Deportes thinks about what it needs to do the Portes really believes that it is the voice for covering soccer. And so it has an opportunity through digital to change its primary focus. It's got to do great stuff on the network, but also to make sure that it's driving this content into FC and helping us understand an audience that's becoming even more multilingual over time. Um, SportsCenter, 
is really thinking about how many more ways it can serve people in the live game window. There was a time where you know, SportsCenter was on at 6, and it was on at 11, and it was on at 1, and we'd re-air it. Now SportsCenter's on 18 hours a day. And um, those folks are busting it all day long. And yet they know when games start, they have even more responsibility to let people know that SportsCenter is watching all of the games so that they can decide what the top 10 plays of the night are. And they have an opportunity to tell these audiences, whether it's through a special alerts product or whether it's within the SportsCenter feed, hey, a great play happened and you will learn more about it at 11 o'clock. Or, you know, if you go through our newsroom, folks are sitting in pods and, you know, they're yelling at the TVs and they're, you know, we've got this in-game analysis happening that is really, really cool. Some people think that we, we hire these ex-athletes just to come on air and just sort of talk. They sit in the pods with our producers. So when Kobe Bryant sprained his ankle, Kurt Rambis was in the newsroom. He stood up, he said, oh, that's, that's, a, that's a Achilles tendon. <laughs> you know, we thought an ankle sprain, no, it's Achilles tendon, he's gone. And, you know, because he was reaching back. Kurt Rambis is the first one to say that. John Kruk will watch a baseball game and turn to a production assistant all game long. That's a meaningful play. Nah, I don't know, that, know about that so much. And then we start thinking, well, maybe that's something our audience would like. So how do we drive that as online, uh, real-time, mobile engagement with the Sports Center brand? Uh, it's literally never been a better time to be a fan because there's so much opportunity out there. And as a result, I think it's never been a better time for Sports Center because the way we think about serving fans, the like, you know, incessant sort of drive to serve fans, is leading us to all these really cool conversations. Um, you know, our video alerts product, especially during college football season, is ridiculous. You know, I have, like I said, I got three kids, and I don't get a chance to sit down and watch, you know, six hours of college football. Or, so I walk around all day, and bing, I get a great play, you know, and I can make my own decision as to when I dip back in, whether it's college game day or whether it's sports center, to see the whole highlight. But it's a service to fans. I do think that that means that the resources we use to produce video, on any night we have 80-some people cutting highlights, those resources are changing. So that we're sort of really thinking about, it's not just about cutting video to put in a linear show, it's about cutting video to serve fans. And producers are thinking more broadly. Um, you know, we, we, we hire talent, like a lot of writer talent we hire, has to work across all screens. We've got some great writers who would be, you know, who, who would not make as easy a transition across all of our screens as, say, Michael Wilbon has, or Jamel Hill has, or, or Wright Thompson has. Um, and we coach the, those others up. We coach them up because that video connection is so important. You know, I'm from a newspaper background, and I love long-form journalism. And so I have a group that's focused like crazy on how do we get people to want to consume long form? How can you consume long form on a handset? Well, maybe what we need to do is go old school and do books on tape. Or maybe we need to think about how we actually design our long form. And you'll see this in, a, I think next week we've got this amazing piece that Grantland has done from the Iditarod. Um, and you'll see in the design how it works across all screens, how we drive people to consume it from beginning, like I say 8,000 words from beginning to end, with video placed in the proper context, with stills. This is all, this is all strategic. We want people to have long form, high quality experiences. And so it requires us to do greater work to make sure that that is easy for you to consume. Just as you know, the people who do it best, like Kindle, you, know, you stop reading here, you start here, it knows where, who you are and where you left off. We've got that same responsibility for our fans. Great. Well, we have a few minutes left, and I know we have a couple of microphones roaming around the room, if I remember correctly. So, uh, any questions from the audience? Well, we put an elevator in your house. <laughs> and we put an elevator in your house. No, you know, we just waited for the kids to get older, and that worked out great. You said that you had developed an app specifically to, um, to take a look at your metrics, and could you describe what that is? I, I work for a large company, and that's one of the challenges that we have with online video is the plethora of different platforms that are out there and figuring out how do we measure what's effective and, and what isn't. Yeah, uh, so the question is, did everybody hear the question? Could we also get our uh, name and company you're with? Yeah, my name is Linda Crow, and I work for Oracle. 
Thank you, Linda. Um, there are a lot of companies in this space, you're exactly right. We, this group that we're working with is called Chartbeat, and they're based in New York. Uh, and they help develop a product that's specifically interesting to us and to some media companies called Newsbeat. Um, and the reason we like it so much is we were able to tell them the things that we're really interested in finding out. It actually spurred us to create these screens across all, within all of our newsrooms where we can actually see real time what things are percolating. And the, the screens are amazing. They give sort of a general overview about what's being consumed on ESP, across ESPN digital media. Then it flips to what's the NFL content that's being consumed in the NBA, then the NHL. Then it goes to top videos being consumed. And everything's got an arrow up or an arrow down. And some days it's great, you know, it's really super directional, and some days, you know, somebody has a girlfriend who doesn't exist and it's just depressing because all that fine journalism you're doing over here doesn't really hold up to like the other stuff, you know. Um, but the reason we like them again is, you know, we've spent a lot of time saying video is crucial for us to understand. It's crucial for us to understand across the various varied platforms. It's really important for us to be able to share this information in a way that can inform how we build shows. So, you know, we have those screens in the television newsroom, at our main news desk, which sort of connects all the newsrooms, and then all over our building. I, I've got just a question for you. You know, you guys are such a leader in the, in the you know, setting the, the le that leadership role in the media world today. And uh, what other media companies do you see that, maybe not in your category, not in sports, and not the, the fan base that you have, but who else do you admire? Who, you know, is there somebody out there that's, that's really embracing a multi-channel, multi-platform approach that ESPN is? Well, you're just asking me personally who I admire. I mean, I admire the New York Times. I admire what they're attempting to do. Um, you know, they, they, they are, they've got a varied audience. It's a little harder for, for big media companies like, like that because we know we got sports fans. We, our fans communicate either one of two ways, either cheer or they boo. That's it. There's no like middle ground. And for the Times, the Times got a they got a they got a bigger array of folks that they're trying to serve. So I admire what they're what they're attempting to do. Uh, I gotta think about my I gotta think about my apps because it'll help me sort of guide like where I go all the time. Um, you know, like everybody else, I'm fascinated by Facebook, and I don't really know that I consider them a content company. I consider them an incredible network of individual content companies, about, what is it now, 800 million individual content com companies. They turned us all into content companies, right? Um, uh, uh, I don't know, I'm gonna, you know, I, 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 look, I think the whole land, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by some of the folks in the sports competitive space because I think serving fans is really, really compelling. It's really hard to do. Um, and so, you know, I like these approaches from some of the young upstarts. Um, but, you know, uh, media companies in general, you know, are, I, I would, I'd sort of take us out of the equation. They're trying to find their way. Mercifully for us, we've been in this space a long time. We've had a website for 17 years. We were in the mobile space in 2004 with a product called, called Mobile ESPN. We were selling phones. Didn't work out. It's pretty bad. But we found in 2004 there was incredible value around content in the mobile space. So we've been doing that for 2005. I mean, people turn on ESPN2 and they watch Fantasy Football Now opposite NFL Countdown on Sunday mornings. That show started out as something we started, you know, in mobile. Um, so, you know, we're a little, we're a little different in that, in that regard. There's a question in the back, I think. Oh, here he goes. Good morning. My name is Kevin Johnson with Johnson Media. Uh, we're a marketing and communications firm in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, so far, so good. You've met the expectations. <laughs> Thank God. Um, I've enjoyed it so far. Uh, and I really enjoyed, I have two questions. I'm a huge fan of, of, of ESPN uh, Deportes. And I actually watched the Bo Jackson 30 for 30 oh, cool. last night, which was, which was really great. Uh, the first question is, and this could be considered blasphemous considering your background in newsprint, to what extent, if any at all, do you all consider uh, your advertisers or products in your editorial uh, discussions? And the second is, are there any plans uh, for the 30 for 30 series uh, on those different platforms since it is a long form type of media? All right, so let me just be clear that the first question, I'm very happy you asked. One of the reasons I'm here is because these are my friends and partners here. These aren't, these aren't people that I sort of bump into at conventions. 
We spent a lot of time together, and we spent a lot of time talking about our business. Um, I learned in the newspaper business one very important thing. It sucks to be irrelevant. And I also learned that the editorial department of the newsroom was complicit. And I'll give you an example. When I was deputy managing editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer, I know, I know, we did at least three stories in our business section about Craigslist. I also know, because of that separation of church and state, we did not go upstairs to the folks in Classified and say, yo, you've got a problem. We didn't do that. And next thing you know, that was that. So there's great responsibility for having the right kinds of conversations. Again, we live in a world in which we've got sports living on a calendar. The most important thing is serving sports fans. Folks in sales will tell you there are times where there's an ad execution where I might say, not today, because it'll, in, it'll influence or impact the, f the fan's experience too much. But they'll tell you that I do that twice a year, maybe. Because we also know how important it is, as, the mar as leaders in this space, to show how it can be done. Right? To show, there are some days, we had an amazing takeover ad for the movie Prometheus. Right? Now, it was icky. Kind of just, I watched the full movie just a couple weeks ago. Still having problems. <laughs> Big takeover ad, right? Now, I always like to do this in our, in our editorial meetings. I'm, I'm like, so tell me what the editorial content was on that page that day. And nobody can, because it was an amazing experience. Point is, to have that amazing experience, strategically, we needed to show folks we wanted to work with that we were willing to do that with our site and our products. By the same token, we want people to play our tournament challenge game. And nobody was putting their bracket on the home page before we did, because we also wanted that to be the experience. So it's an ongoing conversation. It's the best way to operate. My people in the editorial department have regular conversations with programming, with sales, with production, because what we want to be is great every time. We know the 35 sports holidays where it's really important not to get in the way of the fan experience, but there are also days that advertisers want to be present. So we got to figure out how that works. That's why we have folks actually building some creative just to show how it can, how it can possibly work. We know that people have 30 second spots and 15 second spots. We know that's a problem, but we also know that if we're smart, if we're able to tell you, listen, this is how video is consumed on a handset, this is why it's a play, not a two minute highlight. You gotta figure out how you can be complimentary so we can get that video start and that video completion. We're ready to have that conversation. Now to your other question, the 30 for 30s are clearly things that have helped elevate our brand. They're amazing. And so we're not pulling off, putting our foot off the pedal at all. This summer we're gonna have nine films directed by nine women um, called the Nine for Nine film series. It sort of falls into the general category. Amazing stories about Pat Summit. Um, uh, Cheryl Swoops, um, just a series of incredible stories. Some you know something about, some you know nothing about. And then beyond that, you know, our ESPN Films group with, under the 30 for 30 brand is thinking about its next array of films. And right now, we're doing 30 for 30 short films online that are about 10 minutes, anywhere from seven, seven to 10 minutes long. We feel that brand will continue to distinguish us, and we want to work with a whole array of directors. It's just, it's a, it's, when you watch one, you know why we do them. You know, the, um, the uh, Jim Valvano film, uh, to me, was the best. It was astonishing. Um, and so, you know, I know, uh, I know some of the storylines coming up are great, and, you know, fans are going to really enjoy them. Big round of applause for Rob. And thank you, Rob, for thank coming. You. Appreciate it. Our next